we're um, lucky to have a couple of speakers with us this morning who are going to be talking about the, the current situation uh, in Kingston. So, first of all, we're going to hear from uh, yeah, Peter Bond um, uh, from uh, Kingston Council, who's going to give us uh, uh, a bit of a presentation around what the, what the current situation uh, of, kind of air quality is in Kingston at the moment. So, over to you, Peter. Good morning everybody, my name is Pete Bonds, I'm an Environmental Protection Officer at the Kingston and Sutton Shared Environment Service. So I'm going to be talking about the current situation with air pollution in Kingston. Um, that's divided into, first I'm going to look at uh, how polluted our air actually is and how that, how that pollution is distributed throughout the borough. Then I'm going to look at the different sources of our air pollution in Kingston. And then we're going to take a look ahead at how we expect air pollution to change in Kingston into the future. So in Kingston we've got two key pollutants of concern and those are nitrogen dioxide and particulate matter. And we subdivide particulate matter into PM10 and PM2.5. I should say this is a little bit technical. Please don't be shy about holding up your uh, red and yellow cards that I'm told you've got. <laughs> Uh, I think there's also a glossary of terms floating about somewhere. So, um, yeah, PM10 and PM2.5 are the two subdivisions of particulate matter. The PM obviously means particulate matter, and the number denotes the size of the particles. So particulate matter is effectively very fine dust suspended in our atmosphere. Uh, PM10 means particles that are 10 microns or smaller in diameter. PM2.5 is obviously 2.5 microns or smaller. Now, the reason that we're concerned about these two key pollutants of nitrogen dioxide and particulate matter is because we have monitored and modelled exceedances of the national air quality objectives for nitrogen dioxide and PM10. Now, I've just uh, roughly transcribed the national air quality objectives onto this slide on the left-hand side. Um, so you can see the smaller number on the left, that's 40 micrograms per cubic meter of nitrogen dioxide is the long-term exposure limit. So that is the annual average over a calendar year that must not be exceeded. And the larger number to the right of that, 200 micrograms per cubic meter for nitrogen dioxide is the short-term exposure limit. So that is the concentration that must not be exceeded for more than a certain number of hours in that calendar year. The way that we monitor our, uh, our air pollutants in Kingston is using a network of three automatic monitoring stations measuring a raft of different air pollutants and meteorological data, as well as a network of 40 nitrogen dioxide diffusion tubes that measure only nitrogen dioxide. And to fill in the gaps between those monitoring sites, we plug that data into a model, or the Greater London Authority does, and that produces this lovely map that we have on the right hand side. So I've given you the map for nitrogen dioxide only, but broadly speaking, as we'll see later, the sources of nitrogen dioxide and particulate matter are roughly similar. So this can be seen as generally indicative of not only the distribution of nitrogen dioxide, but also particulate matter, if not the concentrations of it. Okay. So from the map, you can see that generally speaking, there's a lot of green. A lot of our uh, residents enjoy clean air, air that is safe to breathe, um, but unfortunately 2.2% of Kingston Borough residents are still exposed to illegally high levels of nitrogen dioxide, and sadly those areas encompass three of our schools. It's also important to mention at this point that there is no safe exposure limit to particulate matter. Any level of particulate matter in the air will have negative consequences on human health. So where does our pollution come from? So what you can see on this slide is two pie charts that are produced by the Greater London Authority, and these show the uh, various sources of what's called NOx, nitrogen oxides, in our air. The reason we use NOx instead of NO2 is because when we're looking at emission sources, nitrogen is generally emitted as NO, nitric oxide. Yeah. <laughs> um, nitric oxide, um, and then that bonds with uh, oxygen in the atmosphere to form nitrogen dioxide, which is the pollutant that we're concerned about because it has a, an impact on human health. So immediately you can see that the vast majority of our nitrogen oxides come from road transport from that uh, pie chart on the left. 
The purpose of the pie chart on the right is to break down that 64% of emissions from road transport into the individual constituents on our roads. And you can see immediately that diesel cars are by far the largest single contributor to our nitrogen oxide air pollution. Uh, and that's closely followed by light goods vehicles, powered by diesel, so vans effectively, with an 18% contribution. So, uh, yeah, basically this is the same um, thing, but for particulate matter. So you can see PM10, 10 microns or smaller, on the left, and PM2.5 on the right. And we can see again that road transport is the largest single contributor to our particulate matter air pollution, but its contribution is much less dominant than it was for nitrogen oxides. And what that means is that our non-road -tra non transport emission sources um, take up a larger share when it comes to particulate matter. So in particular, I draw your attention to the contribution of construction, 28% uh, uh, of our PM10 comes from construction, and that's largely construction dust and uh, emissions from non-road mobile machinery, so things like excavators and generators. It's also very important to point out the impact that domestic biomass burning has on PM2.5. So 21% of our PM2.5 comes from domestic biomass, and that's effectively people burning wood in their homes. And I think a lot of people don't realize the impact that that has. So, looking ahead, the graph on the, the is that, yeah, Just so, the, <laughs> so the graph on the left, um, that's a selection of monitoring data from some of our nitrogen dioxide monitoring sites uh, from the years 2013 to 2018, and I've added this because it shows that, generally speaking, there is no significant downward trend in nitrogen dioxide in the borough, and the reason for that is that major improvements in air quality only really come through major policy shifts. So examples from history include the removal of lead from our petrol and the reduction of sulfur content in our fuels. And a much more recent example of a successful major policy shift is the introduction of the ultra-low emission zone in central London. And so that's an emissions-based charging zone in central London in the most polluted area of the city designed to reduce the numbers of the, more, uh, the older, more polluting vehicles. But one thing that we have to bear in mind going into the future with users' expansion scheduled for 2021 is that in removing those vehicles from the central London zone, it is possible that they will be displaced into outer London boroughs such as Kingston, and therefore it is possible that we will see an air quality disbenefit as a result of the introduction of the ultra-low emission zone. But we'll have to wait and see what our monitoring data tells us as to whether that actually materialises or not. The other thing that we have to consider going forwards is that as, generally speaking, our road fleet gets cleaner with tighter emission standards being brought in in the future, the relative contribution of non-road transport emission sources, so things like our construction, dust, and, uh, and uh, domestic biomass burning, will increase relative to road transport. And it's likely that we'll need new legislative tools and a change in our approach in order to accommodate that change. That's all from me. Uh, so thank you very much to, uh, to Peter for that. Uh, so in a little bit, we'll have a bit of time for you to, to reflect on your table about what you've heard. There'll be a, a Q&A session uh, with Peter and Andrew uh, a little bit later. But uh, before we move on to that, now I want to introduce to you uh, Dr. Andrew Cross who uh, will be kind of building on, on some of what Peter's presented there. So uh, I want to make an argument that what Peter's just presented is a public health priority. Um, I'm going to start just be covering a bit about Kingston's population, uh, explain why what has just been described is a problem, uh, and give a quick overview of some of the things that we can do that you'll go into a lot more detail in on over the weekend. But I'll start with, if I'm arguing why is air quality a public health priority, I'm just going to define what public health is. Um, so I work in, in the council. Uh, I started my career as a clinical doctor working in GP surgery hospital, but now I work in the council looking at populations of health. Um, within, within our team in the council, it, the work is divided into three main areas, health protection, to, to help um, limit risks to human health. Uh, that includes things like immunization, uh, preventing the spread of infectious diseases, emergency planning, environmental health, so linked into the air quality, 
discussions. Uh, health services commissioning and support. So not just um, uh, health services, but also health and care services, making sure that services are effective. Um, we look at data to understand issues in more detail and try and target services more efficiently and effectively. And also health improvement. So things you might be familiar with, particularly around lifestyle, around uh, things you can do to improve your own health. Uh, and I mentioned this, uh, the more com less complicated way of saying that is that prevention is better than a cure um, and also cheaper than a cure. So um, we try and think big. So instead of seeing an individual patient in front of me in a, in a, in a clinic now, uh, I think about populations of health and I look at data. Uh, and your, this, this is important for this because it's very easy to picture someone with, with bad lungs, poor air quality and think of them um, you know, suffering the, the effects of that. But this is not just about the individual, it's about the population because we all breathe the air in Kingston um, and we're all affected by it. Um, so Kingston population, uh, as Ian mentioned earlier, there's 176,000 odd people um, living in the borough and slightly more registered with our GPs. We've got a relatively young population, 21%, uh, so about one in five, uh, are people, uh, children aged 0 to 17. Um, and as also mentioned, our um, population is projected to rise. Uh, and that's not uniform across all groups. Um, we're going to have more growth in, expected in teenagers, older working age groups, and retired populations. And that has an impact, um, obviously, on our services that we have to provide as a council and with partners. Uh, about a third, one in three, of our Kingston population are from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds and that's also projected to rise to about 36% uh, uh, over the next 10 years or so. So Kingston Health overall is, is actually pretty good. You're predicted to live longer if you uh, compared to the England average if you were born in Kingston. So. Um, Males at, at birth have a life expected of about 82 years, females uh, about 85 years. Um, but we're not just interested about length of life, we're about interested in quality of life. So that second graph is the healthy life expectancy uh, of our population, and in, and, and in men that's about 69 years, and in women about 70 years. There are about a thousand deaths a year in Kingston. The, the three leading causes of death are cancer, diseases of the circulatory system, so that's your heart and your, uh, how it pumps blood around the body, so that includes things like heart attacks, so blockages to the, the uh, blood supply to the heart, also bleeds and blood clots in your brain, that's a stroke. Uh, diseases of the respiratory system as well, so how your lungs are, are working um, and how you're breathing. So that's important in, in terms of uh, air quality because we know from looking at evidence that having being exposed to higher levels of um, air pollutants can increase your risk of um, all three of these conditions um, so it can contribute to cardiovascular diseases lung conditions infections and cancer so those big conditions that I mentioned uh, are affected by air quality. Obviously those conditions are affected um, by other factors, so you'll be aware of kind of diet, exercise, lifestyle, smoking, can increase your, your risk of getting these types of diseases. But as Ian mentioned earlier, the air quality is the, the biggest environmental source um, of risk to these conditions. So. You can argue about lifestyle and cho personal choices, but you can't really argue that this isn't important because everyone is exposed to the, to the air. Um, and and you know, I can argue on another day that we should be taking uh, uh, action against all of those other factors as well. But today we're talking about air quality and everyone is affected by it. Uh, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to skip over the, But this is just to make the point that this is about a lifetime exposure. It starts before birth through childhood, uh, all of these factors into adulthood, 
um, at different points. Particularly, this is, uh, air quality is important in, in childhood as lungs are developing, uh, and there's good evidence I'm sure we'll come on to later um, to show that it can affect developing lungs. Um, you'll see a few maps like this, I'm sure, over the weekend, uh, and the map that Peter showed earlier, highlighting, you could see that the, the areas of worst air quality are around our major roads. Um, in Kingston, there's about a six year difference in life expectancy between the most deprived area and the least deprived area. Um, and we know that the houses along those busier roads uh, are cheaper, so you're more likely to live there if you're economically disadvantaged. Um, and this is another reason why it's a public health priority. It, it's, it's a contributor, there's, there's many differences for that gap, but it is a, a part of that, um, we think. So, as I said, we're going to go into these uh, all different things we can do to reduce air pollution in more detail. Um, but you'll see uh, that these are taken from a report that the um, public health team produced last year, which focused on air quality. It summarised uh, that the action is needed across planning, uh, uh, development, clean air zones, reducing emissions from our public transport, uh, changing the way that we use transport, uh, walking and cycling, and raising awareness. Um, I mention these because actually, I'm saying it's a public health priority, but a lot of the speakers you'll see this this weekend uh, don't sit within public health um, because the action, it, although it's a public health priority, action is needed across the board and across all different parts of the council. Uh, and so just to finish, these, the next, the last slide um, is, the, is the final bit of this report. It talks about if you can change one thing, if you're a resident, you, sh you should uh, try switching to walking and cycling for short journeys. It gave lots of different ideas for different people. Uh, and this, you know, these types of reports are short. It's better to keep them simple um, because people are only going to take away a few things. But actually this weekend and next, you're going to go into a lot more detail than this. And actually you can go beyond you know, the actions of an individual to what we can do collectively, as was mentioned earlier. So you've got some great speakers um, coming up. Um, some you know, real experts, uh, and it's a great opportunity to, to think big, think that big picture, not just the individuals. What can we do together to tackle this problem? Thanks. So uh, thank you very much to, uh, to Andrew and Peter for those uh, presentations.